It's Culture Week at Coindesk, and today's guest is delving into a few ways in which culture and crypto collide. But that's not all we're talking about. The day after the FDIC took control of Silicon Valley Bank, there were only 12,000 active NFT traders, according to Dab Radar, and that's a number not seen since November of 2021. Joining us now to discuss is Anna Mocha Brands co-founder and executive chair, Yat Su. Yat, so single NFT trades totaled 33,000, just over 33,000 on that day and the lowest daily tally so far this year. The NFT market outlook, in your view, what does it look like uh, amid all these banking concerns and blowups in the crypto industry? Well, I mean, um, the uh, you know, broadly speaking, when you look at, for instance, the number of trades that happened, actually, when I look at the data at, uh, at, at CryptoSlam, it doesn't seem to have indicated uh, the same kind of drop. So right now, for instance, when we take a look for the last uh, so the last couple of days, unique buyers and sellers roughly are at about 60, uh, 50 to 60,000 um, sort of um, uh, unique um, buyers and the transaction volume hasn't dropped as much. So I'm not quite sure. You know, maybe that operator is tracking some specific areas. But I think one other thing is if you take a look at the blue chips of the NFT world, like Board Apes or like the Sewer Passes, for instance, uh, you can actually see that those sale numbers continue to do quite strongly. So I think, again, very similar to what we see, I guess, a little bit with crypto and Silicon Valley Bank uh, circumstance, uh, sort of a flight to quality. That could be one. Um, but also one has to bear in mind that um, in the last couple of weeks, there's, you know, it's individual NFT projects in and of itself. Some of them have had some weakness. So I don't think we should necessarily isolate particular projects themselves and then sort of make a make a statement broadly in the market. But anyway, if you look at the data on CryptoSlam, broadly speaking, NFT sales haven't really had the kind of drop that perhaps uh, DAP Raider is reporting. So there seems to be some inconsistency there. So now yeah. you're getting involved with... Oh, I'm sorry, Christine. Uh, well... Animoca Brands is a, a known for contributing to the open metaverse through gamification, blockchain, and entertainment. And you've also just announced the backing of Nukta, which is Saudi Arabia's first NFT marketplace platform. So what is going on in Saudi Arabia? Well, I mean, first of all, I think the MENA region itself is perhaps one of the most exciting places in terms of the development of the whole sort of, let's call it Web3 or just broadly, even just in the general sort of digital entertainment space. Uh, one little known fact, I guess, is that gaming in Saudi Arabia is actually, I think in terms of ARPU, probably the second or third largest market in the world. Again, I think most people don't know that. Uh, and, and the general gaming culture there is very, very large. Uh, so, and digital entertainment culture. Uh, Nukta is the first NFT marketplace in the region. Uh, and we view it a little bit like, you know, when we made the uh, our investment in OpenSea back in sort of, you know, like, uh, like 20, 2018, 2019, which was a while back, uh, you know, one of the reasons we made that investment was because we wanted to sort of help build the rails of that sort of, um, um, sort of NFT economy, which back then was, you know, non-existent and today has become fairly meaningful. Uh, and we need them in regional places as well. Uh, so you have, you know, in many major markets, you do have regional NFT players, like in Japan, you might have Coincheck, for instance, right? Uh, but the, the MENA region doesn't have one. And so how do we kickstart that is to basically back basically uh, sort of what we think could be, you know, the next open sea in that region to help sort of build that infrastructure. Uh, what's also really interesting about uh, Nukta is that uh, uh, the, the sort of very dynamic co-founder is a lady. Um, and, and again, I think this sort of throws some of the perhaps perceptions people have about the region. It's obviously, um, you know, had a lot of progress, still needs a lot of progress, but it just goes to show that, you know, it's a, it's a place where entrepreneurial dynamism doesn't just happen amongst men, but also is, is growing with women, particularly in the Web3 space. So we're very excited about sort of supporting that as well. And is it, is it involved? Is, is the government involved in it itself? Is, it, is that where the investment is coming from? So, the, well, the investment is all private. Uh, and Animoca Brands basically led this particular round. Uh, so there's no government money. However, Nukta did receive uh, a license uh, from the ministry to operate uh, with digital assets. So that's actually a key win, uh, which is also indicative of the region looking at supporting that. I mean, normally a lot of the attention around sort of the Web3 activity tends to be in the UAE, you know, between yeah. sort of uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Uh, but now Riyadh uh, and, and Jeddah are basically stepping up the game there uh, and saying, you know, I mean, we want to play as well. Yeah, I was going to ask, is, is, is that on purpose? Or is there some sort of rivalry uh, on the peninsula there for, for the NFT market? Or is it just sort of like they, they just want to, you know, have a, have a foot in the, in the door there? <laughs> 
Well, I don't know that it's necessarily a rivalry in in the classic sense because when you think about market economies and size, there is no um, there is no comparison between UAE and Saudi just in terms of um, econ uh, economic sizes. I would say UAE is a gateway to an international uh, world that has access to MENA. Uh, because it's just a smaller region, um, but obviously well capitalized, and there's a lot of people in the Web3 space that live in Dubai, for instance. Uh, whereas uh, I would say that Saudi is more to look at as a domestic market uh, with access to the wider MENA region. Uh, it has a predominantly young population, very active gaming population, um, and and as an economy is large. And if you look at, for instance, Saudi's uh, sort of 2030 uh, vision strategy, it, it tends to actually make the digital economy, particularly gaming and digital sort of, you know, assets, you could say, a key part of its economic pillar um, by 2030. So there's a lot of investment happening to help develop that, uh, to, trying to bring in talent. You know, just to, to, to give you an indication, I think uh, Saudi is probably the only place in the world that has a sovereign gaming fund, uh, for instance, and is also um, the, the only place um, that actually has a uh, sort of large, sort of esports uh, sort of uh, a, a ministry of esports uh, in in yeah. Saudi, right? So that's so just indicate indicative of sort of their ambition in the space. Yeah, kind of the opposite of what the United States, is, but they're they're not fans of uh, Credit Suisse at the moment. But what <laughs> <laughs> while at NFT Paris, you spoke about the importance of creator rights and royalties in the Web three world. So how do you hope to improve that? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we did was we issued um, basically NFT licenses for creators uh, so that they can have a legal way of protecting their royalty rights. As you may, uh, may know, you know, in order to capture market share, a number of marketplaces have basically reduced their royalty rights to low to almost zero. Uh, and that was basically intentional uh, to basically capture market share. And in response, some other marketplaces did the same thing. And so obviously that actually is a problem for us uh, because the reason why... The, these marketplaces, um, the reason why the NFT uh, industry has grown to the way that it is, and just, just for reference numbers, like last year, 2022, in a bear market, uh, there were, it was, it was close to $24 billion of sales that happened in NFTs last year, right? Now, just, just put that in perspective, um, uh, that means that actually, you know, billions of dollars went to creators, but more importantly, a large, you know, an, an even larger number went to owners um, of the assets of these NFTs. That fueled an industry that made it possible to create companies, you know, like Blur or, or OpenSea or Magic Eden. It also made it possible for, you know, uh, companies to, uh, sort of create, you know, these products and services and, you know, whether it's, you know, what, what Yuga did, uh, you know, by launching the other deed or whether it's uh, something like um, what we see Azuki launching or other, or Cool Cats and all of these innovations happened because of the fact that royalties were possible. If you remove that, then you actually end up sending the industry uh, from our perspective backwards. You have basically a kind of free riding effect, which when then we think lead into sort of the kind of tragedy of commons effect where people, you know, th there won't be enough money in the ecosystem to support that. So we think of creator royalties and fees similarly to how sort of gas is uh, sort of important to the Ethereum ecosystem if we were to draw sort of a very rough analogy. Right. Fascinating, Yat. Thank you for joining us. That was Anna Mocha Brands co-founder and executive chair, Yat Su. And don't miss Yat speaking at Consensus 2023 in Austin, Texas. It's not too late to buy your tickets at consensus.coindesk.com.